spanning the nerd world and feeding your fandom. Crash landed. From comics to video games. From the cinematic universe to television. Earth. Connecting you to the biggest stars in the industry. Something out there had discovered us. It's time for the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Here's your host, James Witham. this week's episode just for kicks it's episode 343 of the down and nerdy podcast i'm james with them not often that we can celebrate movie releases in 2020 but that's what i'm doing this week with jujitsu which is the sci-fi martial arts movie that is finally out and elaine musi is a big part of that movie we'll talk to him about working alongside nicholas cage and some amazing stunt work that is a part of this jujitsu movie, which you can see right now. I, I, I got to tell you, a lot of action to be expected. I mean, martial arts and sci-fi, yeah, sign me up for that stuff. Also, the Wonder Woman movie news that has rocked the industry this week. Yeah, I'll sh- share my opinion on that. A couple very interesting new comics. And guess what? It is a double review week once again this week. And we're going to start things off. With the Lego Star Wars Holiday Special from Disney Plus, we'll start with that next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Lexa Doig from Arrow, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. It is the season to celebrate Life Day, and the holiday specials are beginning, and one that I'm sure you're looking forward to is the Lego Star Wars Holiday Special, which is now out on Disney Plus. So I thought I'd give this a quick review, you know, finally get a holiday review in here, because it's 2020, and we need to celebrate a little bit early. I will be dropping some spoilers on this, though, so spoiler warning if you haven't watched the LEGO Star Wars Holiday Special yet on Disney+, Plus, consider this your warning. And this is the time where they're celebrating Life Day, which, you know, I'm not, I won't give away exactly what Life Day is, but basically it's it's like a combination of Christmas and Thanksgiving, which, oh, isn't Christmas kind of a combination of Christmas and Thanksgiving, though, if you want to think about it? Anyway, so... You, basically, you could say they could celebrate this now because the Empire slash First Order is now no more. But but it's funny because Rey is still like super serious, and she really wants to train Finn in the ways of the Jedi. She just he just doesn't seem to be getting it. So of course, in classic Rey faction, fashion, she you know is too hard on herself. So there's this rare event on this particular life day that allows her to kind of time jump a little bit and learn from the best as far as the Jedi Masters are concerned. How do you think that works out? Hmm? Has there been a time jump thing yet where somebody goes and, you, you know, you always blame Barry Allen. But this has happened many, many times before. Like, you know, you know, the whole Biff getting the time machine thing and Back to the Future. And, and, and every time, almost every time Barry goes back in the Flash. I mean, Legends of Tomorrow, the whole show is based on screwing up things by, by time traveling. Anyway, so... It doesn't really go well because the Emperor and Darth Vader kind of discover what's going on here and they decide to try and use this traveling for their own nefarious purposes. Now, Darth Vader, very out of context, very not Darth Vader, Darth Vader in this. I will tell you that much right now. And the the Emperor is kind of a goofy character in this as well. But again, it's Lego and it's supposed to be fun. And, And the Emperor definitely was a fun character in this thing. The only thing that, and I really didn't want to find something I didn't like about this. I really didn't because I was the guy, you know, uh, standing up on my soapbox saying, just enjoy it, shut up, don't worry about anything else. But at the same time, the whole premise of Ray taking the, first of all, she takes off on her friends, you know, and, and kind of ditches the celebration that, that Poe worked so hard to put together and to, to go on this quest to, just to help become a better teacher for Finn? I mean, first of all, I mean, I guess good for you for wanting to go all out for your friend or potential boyfriend, whatever you want to call him, however you want to label Finn and Ray's relationship. It just seemed like it was kind of a lame premise for why Ray was doing what she was doing. I don't mind the whole time jump thing and her, you know, going across all these different Star Wars timeline said that that part didn't bother me, especially with this being a Lego thing. But it, the, like, that's the reason she was doing it. Basically, I mean, that might not have been the sole reason, but that really was 
the reason. I'm not saying I have a better idea of how they should have done that, but it feels like they could have come up with something better, right? Oh, I'm doing this for Finn. So I'm going to take this huge, unnecessary risk instead of, you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. I'm going to take this huge, unnecessary risk instead and see how it works out. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to ditch my friends on their on this huge day of celebration. Even Finn was saying that she shouldn't go. I mean, it's like, come on. Anyway, but here's the deal. There were definitely some fun moments in this. You know, in, involving Poe, obviously. The Kylo Ren stuff was very, very funny. And I, I don't want to get, again, I'm not going to give any of the jokes away, but the Kylo Ren stuff was very, very funny. The, and the You're either going to think the Emperor is entertaining or annoying. There's going to be no middle ground for that. You're going to it's you're gonna fall on one side or the other for that. I'm just going to warn you about that right now. I mean, everybody else, it, it was kind of like a, you know, you get to see certain characters that, you know, don't necessarily fit in one timeline, become a part of that timeline for a short bit or a longer bit. And, and it's interesting to see how they would interact together, even if, again, it is in Lego form. But some of it is almost a little bit true to the story as a whole. I At least I think it is. Anyway, but I, I don't know. I mean, it was fun to see everybody together. Was I jumping up and down about it and, and saying, you know, oh, this is finally, this finally writes the ship. This is finally the great Star Wars holiday special that we deserved. No, not necessarily. Because, I mean, if you think about it, anytime a regular series or movie or something like that tries to do a holiday special or, or something like that, it has to be so out of context, right? that it doesn't always feel natural, and it rarely does. And this is one that just kind of feels like it has to be its own standalone story. That's why I kind of wish they didn't do the whole, you know, Ray going off on this quest to become a better Jedi Master for Finn. I'm kind of wishing that they didn't go that route because you're bringing canon into something that doesn't need any canon. It could have just been completely random and how they went ahead and put this together, you didn't need a strong reason behind why Ray was doing what she was doing. And I actually kind of feel like that sort of backfired on them a little bit. And, I mean, you know how most holiday specials end up too, though. So so there is that. You know, you got that silver lining to look forward to. But at the same time, I don't know. Is this something I'm going to make a yearly tradition? Eh, I don't know. I'm. It was definitely fun. I'm glad I watched it once. I don't know how many more times I would watch it. I mean, unless the kids are into it. If the kids are into it, it's definitely tolerable for you to watch over and over again. But I, I'm, I got to tell you, I'm not in a rush to hit play on the Lego Star Wars holiday special again, even though it absolutely positively was not as bad as the original Star Wars holiday special. That's going to do it for my spoiler-filled review of the Lego Star Wars holiday special. How about another review? Let's tackle HBO Max's The Flight Attendant. That series debuted early, and we'll talk about it next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Julie Nathanson from Far Cry 5, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Gotta love it on your flight when you get some early boarding, and that's exactly what HBO Max did for fans by giving us an early look at the first episode of The Flight Attendant, starring Kaylee Cuoco, supposed to debut on Thanksgiving this year. Actually, they put the first episode out. A little bit early, so I thought I'd give a little bit of a review of this first episode. Of course, you know it follows a flight attendant named Cassie, who's played by Kaylee Cuoco. And I'm going to try to be as spoiler-free as possible here, since there's there's a chance that you might not have seen the episode yet, and I don't really want to spoil anything for you. So I certainly won't spoil anything major, but I will say that as far as Cassie goes, she really does fit... You know, a few tropes and stereotypes, you know, like she's a party girl, she drinks too much, you know, she's kind of famously irresponsible sort of thing, and, you know, her family knows it, her friends know it, her co-workers know it, and stuff like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, she's she's still fun, right? But you also know from the trailer that she meets someone and hooks up with a passenger that was on her flight that, that was going to Bangkok. Now... The thing about this first episode is the mystery just kind of begins to unfold in this first episode. So I can tell you that. You'll, you'll get the beginning of the mystery 
in this first episode. And it really is a mystery, too. That's just it. This isn't just some random thing, too. There's there there are steps to this. And it's kind of interesting how we as viewers actually get the bits and pieces of what happened. And and when you see the episode, you'll understand what I mean there. How we get those revelations is actually it's it is unique actually, in its own way. There's also a twisted element to what's happening with Cassie, especially in this first episode, and, and you will see triggers from certain things, maybe some, some stuff that's going to be happening from her past and things like that that will come up because of this. But i got to tell you, we do get to see a lot of sides to Cassie's character, and Kaylee Cuoco really does a great job of balancing them all really well. The, the thing about these characters is a, a lot of them just seem very normal. Like you'll see a lot of normal reactions to stuff that's going on uh, around them. And, and I mean, especially with like, like the flight crew, they're, they're your very, you know, it's it's your typical workplace dynamic, really. They, they, they actually capture it very well. I mean, the pilot's a little over the top, but that's, you know, that, that, that that's fine. And I will say that there's really not. I know that the part of this com- is is considered a comedy, especially with Cuoco's involvement. But I don't know. I don't know that there's much comedy here. I'm not saying that there was like zero laughs at all. There was certainly some stuff that was that was funny, but the, a lot of it was a lot darker and more serious than I would have thought in this first episode. Anyway, does that mean there's going to be nothing funny from here on out? No, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be nothing funny, but I would not at all consider this a comedy. I would say with the, it, it's more, some of the characters are more fun loving than anything else. I, maybe some stuff that, that, that said could be considered funny, but in the context, I'm not, I don't know if it is or not. So we'll have to, you, you'll, you'll have to be the judge of that for yourself. Now there's not really much going on with the other characters though, early on. If there's one gripe I have about this, it's that, there's really, as far as the other characters go, we don't really know a whole lot about them. And I, I know that this character is, is the, excuse me, this show is all about Cassie right now. And she's the main focus of the show. But at the same time, it seems like all these other supporting characters are more there as a function of how they view Cassie to kind of help hammer home, home the point of who she is. And I'm not sure that there's really much else to them. So I kind of hope we see some depth added there, especially Cassie's friend Annie, which is, who's played by Zosia Mehmet. I think that that could be a really cool character going forward that we're going to see a little bit more often. Rosie Perez does a good job as well. But I, I got to tell you, though, I think that as far as the mystery goes, I think that they have something here. But again, they don't give you a ton of information in this first episode, but you'll get something right at the end of their first episode that really kind of adds to the intrigue and, and sort of answers the question that you might have in the midway point of the episode. Something might seem like it doesn't fit in or it doesn't make a whole lot of sense or it was just a function of like a means to an end sort of thing, but there's actually more to that than you think there is. And when you see it, I'm sure you'll know what I'm talking about. But I got to tell you, I was, I was intrigued at how this series was going to play out. And after seeing the first episode, I I am definitely I am definitely in. I'm definitely down for this for this series. And and again, I mean, I'm just a Kaylee Coco fan anyway. So you already had me there. But it's a very different type of character for her, and I really really love that. You don't want to see her just playing these random you know penny clone comedy type roles. This is not that at all. There's a lot more depth to this Cassie character then meets the eye on the surface, even in the trailer as well. So, yeah, if you haven't watched it yet, you've still got a chance to watch the first episode for free from HBO Max. If you're an HBO Max subscriber, of course, the rest of the series will debut. Well, the first three episodes, I think it is, debut on Thanksgiving Day this coming Thursday. So go ahead and prepare yourself to check that out. That's going to do it for my spoiler-ish, kind of more free-than-ish review of The Flight Attendant. Up next, we'll hear from one of the stars of the jujitsu movie. Elaine Moussi joins me next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hey, this is Mark Paul Gossler from The Passage, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. So this is a guy that you've probably seen a lot more than you think. He's done a lot of stunts for 
shows and movies that you love, like Arrow and X-Men movies and things like that. And he's gotten into acting a little bit. If you've seen the Kickboxer movies, you've seen him as well. He's got a brand new movie coming out called Jiu-Jitsu this November. You're going to learn a lot about him, trust me. It's Elaine Moussi. Elaine, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How about you? Doing great, man. Now, you've actually been involved in martial arts for like 30 years, I think it said. So, when, when, and then when I think about action movies, I think about martial arts. That's the first thing that I think of. So what is it about martial arts that you think just continues to captivate audiences? Oh my God, it's just, it, it's entertaining to watch. I mean, it's, uh, I, I think it, martial arts is the kind of, kind of action that you can see yourself doing no matter what, right? So if you were to put the time in, you were to, to practice hard, you see yourself being able to do whatever the hero's doing. So because you're, it's so relatable and most of the time it's also uh, depicted by, I guess, I guess, an underdog fighting a bully and everybody wants to feel that way. It's, it's, you know, everybody can connect to it. And that's why it's so popular. So you've done stunts, like I said, for some big projects. The, the first Suicide Squad movie, you were the stunt, uh, the stunt person for Jai Courtney. For X-Men Apocalypse, it was Hugh Jackman and so many others, too. So when you approach those roles, how important is it to make sure that you stay true to the character and making sure every move is authentic and true to form? Oh, it's so important to me because the fight itself or the, the action is the, is part of the character as well. So as a stunt double, it's all different than just uh, when, when you're acting. When you're acting, you are the character. You get to create it, and then you stay true to it. When you're a stunt double, it's a little different because you're not yourself creating the character. You're doubling somebody who's creating the character. So not only are you want to see, do you want to stay true to the character itself, but you want to stay true to the interpretation the actor that you're doubling is putting into it. So it's, uh, it's slightly different in uh, mindset. And one of my, uh, on my first project ever, Immortals, my friend Mark Cooper is the one who told me this. He says, remember, Alain, and I was green. He says, when you're doing this, when you're doubling Henry Cavill and you're do- playing Theseus, you're not playing Theseus. You're playing Henry playing Theseus. And I'm like, oh, my God, that makes so much sense. And it's in that sense... You have to study the actor that you're doubling as much as know the character that you're also, you're, you're also playing, essentially. So it's like two things at once. It's really interesting. So, Elaine, correct me if I'm wrong, but you actually played Batman in Titans, correct? I, I did. I share the role with my friend, my dear friend, Max Savaria, who's another stunt uh, performer here in Canada. I, I was cast uh, by the stunt coordinator as, uh, as Batman for Titans. Then something happened on set, and they had to delay the, the last day of the shoot. So, and I wasn't available. I was out of the country. So my friend Max, who's doubled me, or actually, I can't say doubled me. He's, he comes in as the stunt double for my films. He's a very good friend of mine. He took over my, the role as Batman when I couldn't do it. So if there's any character, though, that would need two stunt, two stunt people, it would be Batman, though, right? Absolutely. Well, anyone, you know, often on these big blockbusters, uh, there's, there's more than one stunt double. There's a main double that follows the actor on the main unit, but often there's either a second unit or a third unit shooting at the same time. So it, it's happened. I've been on productions where they have two doubles or three doubles for one single actor, especially in, in like when you have Batman or the big, big Marvel movies. Often you might have two stunt doubles playing, you know, playing the character. Actually, on Logan, so after I doubled Hugh on, uh, on Apocalypse, I was asked to go in and with the, join his regular double, Daniel Stevens, on Logan, and I, I wasn't available. I couldn't do it. But they, they had two doubles on that film the whole time. Wow. Now, you've done some stunt coordinating as well. As a stunt coordinator, what is that, how is that like to kind of, you know, kind of meld all those things together? Because that seems like, that, I never knew that. That just seems like a lot. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot to think about. I mean, when you're you're stunt coordinating or you're action action directing, what your 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 goal is to bring the director's vision to life, right? So you're serving the project, you're serving the director, and you kind of you have to to connect with them, see what he sees, see his vision, and once you have that, then you get into the design mode. So you're you want to make sure it's cool action and cool moves and all that, but at the same time, you want to make sure that the action tells a story, and that's what's most important. That's what's compelling to audiences is when the action is not just a collection of moves and punches and kicks. It's when you can feel and see the story unfold in movement. And when you do that, when you feel that, automatically you have great action design. No doubt about it. Now let's talk about jujitsu for a second because it's not very often we see martial arts and sci-fi combined, which I, th- I think is going to be great. So for anyone that might not be familiar with the project, tell us a little bit about the movie and about your character as well. Okay, well, the film is about, is about an alien being who comes to Earth every six years to battle a group of jiu-jitsu specialists, jiu-jitsu warriors. And I play one of the Jake, Jake who's one of the jiu-jitsu warriors. 
and who has to face this alien being. And every time, the alien being is the one who wins, essentially. It's a, it's a battle that happens every six years. And when you go into this battle, you expect that you might die. You probably will die. So my character, Jake, decides that that's kind of like a crappy idea. I don't want to die. I want to be alive. So in terms of that, he decides to, his course of action leads him away from the fight which infuriates this alien. And what he has to do, what Jake has to do, is after losing his, uh, his memory, he has to discover who he is, face his fears, overcome his fears, and face the alien, the, I guess, the unbeatable alien. Nice, nice. I love it. You actually get to work with a really impressive cast on this movie as well. I mean, you've got Nicolas Cage, Frank Grillo, Marie Avgaropoulos as well. So how was it working with them? And whose action skills kind of surprised you the most during filming? I mean, everybody's action skills impressed me a lot. Uh, so, so because not all of them are martial artists, right? I think I, every one of those kids, those people, uh, Nicolas Cage and uh, Frank Grillo, Maria Avdropoulos, they all have a lot of experience doing film fighting in various movies or TV shows they've been in, right? So they were all very skilled and they were all very uh, coachable, which is really, which is great. That's what you want to, you know, you want to feel is somebody that, that actually wants to be there and they want to learn, they want to do the action. Nick Cage impressed me a lot, obviously, because you know, I was a huge fan of Nick Cage as well. I still am a huge fan of Nick Cage. And, and, you know, he wanted to dive right in. He wanted to do as much as possible. He wanted to learn. He wanted to practice right away as soon as he landed in Cyprus. So that was fun. And, and it's, working together was amazing. He's, uh, he's so passionate about his craft. Which is fun, and it's 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 fun to see in, in a veteran actor like he is, right? Frank Frank's uh, Frank's jokes, he's awesome. He's he loves doing the action as well. So he was fantastic to work with. And Maria Dropolis was funny enough. She she had that one uh, one scene that she's got with uh, Tony Jaw. When, when and funny enough, she didn't know who Tony Jaw was. And Tony Jaw is a major martial arts superstar, right. right? And then as soon as she found out who he was and kind of had an idea she's like oh my god so as much as she's done tons of film fighting in uh in the hundred and she's great with swords she was like okay like this is tony jaw this is going to be cool but you know she did it like a pro she did all her action she was fantastic you know so yeah this cast is, is incredible and we're full of real martial artists such as juju chan and tony jaw our friend playing the alien ryan Karen, also like a lifelong martial artist so this movie is stacked with uh action talent that's what's cool. Absolutely. We're talking to Olay Moussi, who, of course, is, uh, plays Jake on Jiu-Jitsu and many other movies as well. You can see that this November. Now, Elaine, when you see a movie that, that a movie's featuring aliens, or an alien, as it were, that's kind of a vague description because we've kind of moved on in movies from the, you know, stereotypical little green men sort of aliens. So <laughs> we know that he's vicious. How would you describe him without really spoiling anything? Oh, man, uh, this alien is... How do I describe him? He's a, he's a warrior from another world. That's what I would describe him. He's a warrior from another world. That's the best way. Imagine if you had a galactical samurai. Okay, that's, that's our alien. Mm. That's who he is. So it's not this little green guy with, like, you know, tentacles. and It's none of that. It's imagine if someone from another world would kind of be like us, but just from another world. That's kind of how you got to picture it. Maybe, you know, he's got different attributes. They think differently. They have a different language. All this kind of stuff obviously changes, but they're still humanoid, if you want to call it that, mm. right? So that's what's cool about this alien is that you can actually, when you see him, when you, he, he's in the, the film, when you watch, you're not just watching something that could never be. It's almost like, huh, man, that, 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 that could exist, which is awesome. Awesome. Makes him so much more relatable to an audience. And I, I think that's cool. I love that, man. I love that. Now, I grew up watching a lot of martial arts movies. I mean, American Ninja and pretty much anything ah, with Jean-Claude Van go. Damme. So we know that Jean-Claude specifically has like signature moves where you see, you're like, that's a Jean-Claude Van Damme move right there. Would you say mm -hmm. that you kind of have a signature move that fans would recognize in your movies? I definitely do. Yeah, I have uh, some, some of the moves that I'm doing now and uh, this is the third film that you're going to recognize for sure, guaranteed. There's like three, four of them that I, I kind of, Pepper in whenever they, they, uh, they're relevant, whenever they should be there. But absolutely, I do. Is that something that just sort of happens, though, or is that something you actually work on? Well, it's stuff I've been working on since I was a kid, a lot of them. And then others that kind of now happen, you know, they just happen when we're creating the fights for the movie. I think, like, some of the moves, I, as a kid, obviously, I emulated uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. He was one of the reasons. He was my inspiration to start martial arts. So 
definitely there's some semblance there. There's some moves that I've been doing since I was a kid that were things I've seen him do in movies. And then you kind of have your, you, you, usually you start with, you know, trying to imitate something you love and then you take that and then you kind of innovate from there and make it your own, which is great. You know, so definitely like, uh, like w one of the moves, the key moves in uh, kickboxer retaliation was the backflip off the chest of uh, the mountain. That was uh, in a kick. It's like a backflip. It's a kick flip, you know, I guess a gainer off his chest which is pretty cool. So that's become like one of my things I do or the, um, there's a move called the loser. Funny enough, it's called the loser, <laughs> but it's uh, you go backwards and you do like, as you swing your leg, your leg backwards, you do a front flip and you kick the guy with your heel under the, under oh, the chin. Nice. Um, so like, that's one of the moves I've been doing in every, every show as well. So yeah. So I guess you kind of, you do things and you see what sticks, what people react to. And that becomes your thing. Now you mentioned kickboxer a minute ago and you know, of course, Jean-Claude was a big part of that franchise as well. And you've been able to kind of, I don't want to say take over, but you know, you've kind of breathed new life into that franchise. What was it like to do that and bring it back for fans? It was amazing. I was, it was one of my favorite movies as a kid. So I felt privileged that this was the the movie I was going to do first. You know, it's uh, it's really cool. So when Dimitri told me about it, Dimitri Logothetis, our director, producer, he's the, he's the one that gave me the opportunity, and he's the one who revived the Kickboxer franchise. So Dimitri told me told me about it, and I thought it was brilliant. You know, there's definitely nervous as well because you're. I, I know it's uh, Kickboxer is a fan favorite mm -hmm. of Van Damme's movies. So at the same time, there's a little pressure there where you feel obviously you're going to be compared to the original. But, you know, I tried to, to not think about that too much and just try to think of it as a new version for a new audience. And that's the, my, that was my approach to it. And uh, I, I thought it was awesome to do the project. And the icing on the, on the cake was the fact that Jean-Claude was in the film, right? He plays the mentor in the mm -hmm. film. So that was, uh, that was awesome to me. It's almost like going full circle. Yep, you know, definitely. I started martial arts after seeing the like, Bloodsport and Kickboxer. And all of a sudden, that's my first, film my first acting role in a film and it's kickboxer with van damme you know i, I don't know that's it, pretty cool now elaine before i let you go as you start doing more and more acting is there any certain role or like a certain franchise that you would love to be a part of at some point oh my god there's so many i mean i love doing original content that was the beauty of jujitsu was something brand new something original something that's never been done before you know in terms of that story it's not a remake so i i love doing that and going forward, I mean, if, you know, if there's a, if, if there was a DCU or a Marvel character that was really cool, and obviously there's tons of them that are really cool, by the way, but, you know, something where it's a role that's very, not necessarily of superpowers, but physical, you know, that's what I, I, I love, you know, and in in, when you have an enhancement of what is already possible, that, that would be really great. So, yeah, of course, I would love to be in that world. But I'm open to everything, to be honest with you. I, I love doing anything that's action-related or um, I guess a genre where I, I can't wait to be in is uh, action comedy. Give me a, something like a Rush Hour. Oh, my God. Yes. That, that would, to, to me, that's a dream. Action comedy that way, Lethal Weapon, Rush Hour, that kind of thing, mixing the martial arts, the action, the comedy together. And, and to me, that's ultimate. That's, uh, I can't wait to do that. Now, you spoke about, you know, how, you know, pretty much if you if you apply yourself, everybody can do the whole martial arts thing. You actually have a martial arts fitness thing that you're doing right now. Where can people find more information about that? Yeah, it's called K2X Fit. Uh, K2XFit.com is where you can find the information. K2X Fit is kind of a full transformation program. We kind of, we built this program, myself and my business partners, while I was training for various films, you know, whether it was for doubling or myself in the Kickboxer franchise. But it, it's, a, it's a full transformation program with that, that includes fitness, nutrition, accountability, which is amazing. And often, you know, when people tackle this huge task of, you know, wanting to get in shape, it's very, it, it's tedious, it's overwhelming. There's so much information out there and it, it's hard to stay accountable even to yourself. The way we've designed the pillars, it simplifies everything. The workouts are designed and we know they work because I've done them and they work as much for somebody that's starting out as for somebody that's been a veteran athlete. And then there's the nutrition aspect of it. And again, there's so much information. We work with Dr. Kashi, which is like a top, like one of the top nutritionists in the U.S. Um, for sports nutrition. He's the youngest microbi microbiologist in the U.S. Uh, right now. So he, he's incredible. His program, he, he consults with pro athletes, with Olympic athletes, 
all year round. So we work with him in terms of nutrition. And obviously the coaching is the accountability where you have somebody that follows you every step of the way to make sure that you're accountable to yourself and accountable to somebody else. So it's uh, it's a very, very complete program. And the success we've had with it is amazing. And you can do it right from home, but that's what's great is you're connected to a coach and you can do this like right from home remotely. And it's awesome. So K2XFit.com. I love that, man. I love that. And you can see him in jujitsu. with The brand new movie is going to be in theaters and video on demand, actually, this November. Look out for another kickboxer movie as well with this guy, too. It's Elaine Moussi. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Hey, thanks for having me. That's awesome. This is comic book artist Annie Wu, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. No matter how you're flipping the pages, whatever you're reading on, it's time for what we're reading and... Maybe you feel like you should have seen the Black Widow movie by now, and I, you know, I don't blame you if you feel that way. So how about a little bit of what we could have expected, possibly, from the Black Widow movie with Widowmakers, Red Guardian, and Yelena Belova, number one from Marvel Comics. Devin Grayson on the writing here, Michelle Bandini on the art, is Elisabetta D'Amico on the ink assists here, Eric Arkiniga on the colors, and VCs Corey Pettit doing the letters, Cover coming to you from Michael McCone and Chris O'Halloran. Now, there will be some spoilers for this because this book is already out, so I'll go ahead and give you a little bit of a spoiler-filled review here. You can actually kind of call this a Widow for Hire story, and it's Yelena that is very much at the center of it, and she's kind of hired to infiltrate and extract a prisoner from a former S.H.I.E.L.D. black site in Antarctica. Well, and here's the biggest spoiler so far. She kind of discovers that this is all kind of a ploy to train operatives and then they try to kill her. I mean, it seems like that's what it is anyway. But, you know, that I, I was wondering as I'm reading this, like, is that really what this is about or was this a distraction? It, it, it just seems like there was... Maybe I'm reading more into it than there actually was. But she actually ends up finding that Red Guardian is there in this prison as well. And after a few beatings and escape and a power move later, we kind of find out what Yelena's true mission really is. And what it really does here is this, when I first read this, you know, it kind of almost reads like a one shot to me, right? But clearly this is kind of the start of a continuing story. It's almost like a tie in to the Black Widow, the the actual Black Widow run that's going on, but not a purposeful tie-in, right? Like It's not like, you know, when you have these big event arcs and you have the tie-ins, it's almost like the tie-in is the thing that's leading into the big event instead of the other way around. So it's almost like a prequel of what's to come in the Black Widow comic itself. I mean, it's intriguing and clever, for sure, no doubt about it. And this is the kind of thing that that would actually have my attention if it was something that was going to be happening in the Black Widow movie. I mean, obviously, I think the premise for the Black Widow movie is going to be a little bit different here. But hey, I, it's something that I definitely enjoyed. And, and Yelena Belova is a character that you could almost call this her number one. Red Guardian certainly a part of it. But Yelena very much doing the lion's share of the work in this issue. The art is crisp and clean. Really, really good stuff. So yeah, give me more of this Widowmaker's book from Marvel. I'm really interested to see where this is going to go. And I'm already reading the Black Widow run anyway. So I'm all in for the rest of it. How about we head to the bottom of the ocean where things can get pretty scary. Just like Sea of Sorrows, number one, from IDW Publishing. Publishing, excuse me. Richard Doik on the writing here. Alex Cormack doing the art. And Justin Birch on the letters. Again, some spoilers here because this book is already out. It really starts out with a salvage crew kind of looking for gold in the wreckage from the Great War. Now, it seems like some of the crew's uneasy and the other half seems very, very reluctant. And and I say uneasy in that they don't seem to like each other very much. It seems to be some infighting and maybe some betrayal possibly going on here. But what's going on on the surface wasn't really as interesting as what was happening at the bottom of the sea. Now, this is one thing I will not spoil because it's not often you can kind of have that what the hell was that reaction when you're reading something. But this story definitely had that. Now, whether or not they actually found what they were looking for is a debate that you can have 
after you're done reading this first issue. I mean, it seems like the thing that you could even make the argument that they were the thing to be found. And you, that'll make more sense again once you read the issue. But the art is so uh, the art's one of the things that really brings you in on this, especially the, da- the, the way that they use the colors or lack thereof. It's dark. It's gritty. And it really, really adds to the element of suspense here. There, there is certainly a mystery going on here, and there's certainly, I mean, there's some horror elements, there's some mystery elements, there's some thriller elements, drama, there's a lot going on in this first issue as far as I'm concerned. There's just enough answers, too, to the questions to keep you engaged but still guessing, and that is absolutely a fine line that is difficult to walk. So throw this one in the poll box as well. A couple winners this week with Widowmaker, Red Guardian, Yelena Belova, number one, and Sea of Sorrows, number one. That's going to do it for what we're reading. Up next, some major, major nerd news that could rock the movie industry, and we'll get to it next. I'm James Witham, and this is the Down and Nerdy Podcast. My name is uh, Liam Sharp. I draw Wonder Woman. I co-founded Mayfire, and I'm a dear and close friend of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Some say it would never happen, but the game has been changed. It's time for nerd news. And I got I to admit, this is something that I even did not think was going to happen. But in this world of 2020, this really is the year where almost anything can happen, isn't it? I, you know I'm talking about Wonder Woman 1984. It is official. There will be a dual theatrical and HBO Max release on Christmas Day in in the United States, and that, to me, is unbelievable. And it was officially announced. This isn't one of those, you know, came from a source type of things. No, 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 no. This was officially announced by Warner Brothers Entertainment and HBO Max, and, and it's up there everywhere now. And I got to say, this is, this is a stunning move and says everything about where we are as far as being able to get back to normal, or at least what we knew as normal anyway. And this, to me, just says, you know what, why are we sitting on this? And and that's the the argument that that I had. And that's the argument I would present to a lot of other movies that are delaying, is I get, you know, money. I get it, okay? But why are you sitting on this? The longer you sit on this, the more you put yourself behind the eight ball and the less relevant, quite frankly, you even become. So Warner Brothers made the tough decision to go ahead and release this Wonder Woman movie on HBO Max. And I get it. People wanted to see it on the big screen. You're still going to have an opportunity to see it on the big screen. You know, if your state has an open movie theater or there's an open movie theater near where you are, or if movie theater is even still a thing by December, who knows? But you still at least have the opportunity to see it in a theater, but you also have the option to be, you know, safer at home, like a lot of, you know, states are saying now. Internationally, it will get some theatrical releases as well, starting on December the 16th, so a little bit earlier on the international front. Let's let's put it this way. This movie's going to make money one way or another, right? The HBO Max window, by the way, only going to be for one month. It's only going to be... For a one month stretch, but you know what? You're gonna, you're either gonna watch it right away, or you're not. Right? You're not gonna wait like two weeks, three weeks, and go like, oh, you know what? That's right. Wonder Woman eighty four was on HBO Max. I'm gonna check that out. No, 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 no. You're gonna probably watch it. If you're gonna watch it on HBO Max, you're gonna watch it within the first week. You're gonna find a way to do that, right? It's it's not like it's a series that you have to commit, you know, ten hours to or whatever. It's a it's a two it's a two hour plus movie that you have to sit and devote that time to. You even if you've got kids at home like me, you're going to be able to figure out a time to be able to watch this movie on HBO Max early. Plus, you're going to want to avoid spoilers too anyway. So why wouldn't you just go ahead and watch it right away? But here's the big and you can't help but ask the bigger question, right? It would be irresponsible to not ask the bigger question. This is the most significant domino to fall in this whole movies at home thing ever since this whole thing started right of you know early releases theatrical releases whether it be on video on demand or on a streaming service things like that 
I understand that Mulan was big. The way they did that, though, was kind of messy. And this one is going to be, it's legitimately free for HBO Max subscribers. There's no extra charge. They make, made sure that they put that out there. So no extra charge. This one is, this is a huge, huge movie to just be available for free to HBO Max subscribers. You could make the same argument for the Justice League Snyder Cut. And I would I would argue that Wonder Woman 1984 is much bigger because it's completely brand new. And I realize the Snyder Cut will be mostly brand new as well, but it's completely brand new. It's a movie that is a follow up to a very much beloved original movie with Gal Gadot and Patty Jenkins in the first Wonder Woman movie. This is something that's been highly anticipated, star studded cast, and now it's going to be available on a streaming service, or if you absolutely positively have to see it in the theater or you want to brave the theaters, you can you can make that choice for yourself. And the way that they will be able to report these HBO Max subscriber numbers based on people subscribing just to watch this is going to be off the charts. But you have to wonder, right, is this going to start a trend? It's like everybody, it, it was kind of like when sports started canceling sports, right? They waited to see who was going to be the first one, and then the dominoes started to fall, right? Will this announcement, will this decision about Wonder Woman 84 have a ripple effect across other studios, especially if virus numbers don't improve? Will this force the hand of, say, Marvel Studios with Black Widow? Or will it force the hand of, you know, it's some, some movies that might be coming out even a little bit later, like Jurassic World Dominion and and Top Gun and things like that. And I could, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Anything basically that's releasing in 2021, especially early in 2021, does this force their hand to kind of do something similar or the same thing? I don't know. I don't know that this is going to be a huge trend and like all movies will do this now. But at the same time, I think that Hollywood executives are becoming wise to the fact that people in general are getting frustrated with the constant move in release dates. And I also think that they're understanding that people are just not, as a whole, not not to the degree that they need them to be anyway, are not comfortable going to a movie theater right now. They're just not. And, you know, is 25% capacity worth it? Is 50% capacity worth it? I've, I've made this argument before. Is, is anything less than full capacity worth a theatrical release of a movie in several major markets or, or, or all markets across the United States. I don't know. That's not my call to make because it's not my money that is at stake here. And will this affect budgets of movies going forward if they have to do that? I think that the, the budgets are already being affected because you're, you're hearing about Jurassic World Dominion having this huge COVID-19 filming budget because of all the testing that they have to do and the other safety precautions and things like that, it's it's really raised up the budget for that movie. So that might be one that has to hold out until the very last minute because they need that extra money. And But here's the deal. It's not like TV shows aren't doing the same exact protocols, right? They're do- Now, granted, they, there's differences between shooting television and shooting movies. I understand that. But it's not like the testing is any less stringent on television series than it is on movies. It's a sag after thing. The unions agreed to these testing protocols. The unions don't just represent movie or television. It represents actors and, you know, the and producers, directors, things like that. These unions are representing you no matter what role you have. So it is a universal thing that's costing everybody a bunch of money. So, TV is, is I know that TV isn't free, but I mean, you're not plunking down money every time you want to watch an episode of The Flash is what I'm saying, right? So if they're having to do it and those shows are still somehow making money, why can't movies do the same thing is my argument. So I don't know that this will be a permanent change type of situation, but it's certainly an interesting one and one that I was not expecting to be just jumping out like this. I mean, this is pretty incredible as far as I'm concerned. But the Wonder Woman news did not stop there this week. And speaking of the CW and the Arrowverse, which is what I'll call it forever, Deadline 
was the first to report that a Wonder Girl series is going to be headed to the CW. And if you thought DC Future State was just going to go away at the end of 2021, you are wrong because this Wonder Girl is going to be Yara Floor, who is the Latinx Amazon that is going to be created by Joel Jones for the DC Future State comics. Now, of course, she's going to be Wonder Woman in the comics, but for this series, she's going to be Wonder Girl. And if you're wondering, yes, Berlanta Productions is involved in this one. Dahlia, Rod- Dal- excuse me, Dalian Rodriguez, who does Queen of the South, is going to be the executive producer and the sh- and the co showrunner for this series, though. So again, I think a very good choice for a showrunner here, and I'm sure that she's going to be writing the series as well. I'm sure there'll be a writers' room, but certainly going to be writing the pilot for this. No casting announcement, but you should really kind of expect that and it's I think this is going to be a really cool series because she's described as a Latina dreamer who was born of an Amazon warrior and a Brazilian river god so to me right there that just jumps out at me because Wonder Woman has never been shy about tying in mythology in its in its storytelling and I if we get a Brazilian mythology tie-in to this series, I think that that's going to be really, really interesting. And, of course, Yara is going to be using her power to fight evil forces that would seek to destroy the world. And that just opens the door for freaking anything. And because of, you know, are we going to see established, you know, Wonder Woman slash Wonder Girl villains in this thing? Are we going to see newer villains because we're going to get that Brazilian tie-in here? It all of these things kind of remain to be seen, but what we, we are, what we are going to be getting is a female-led hero series, which is always great. The first Latinx suit-led superhero series for as far as female is concerned, or a male or female, actually, if I'm remembering it. It's certainly from DC, anyway. There's certainly probably been others that there have been in other genres, but... As far as DC goes, their first Latinx-led superhero. Don't forget, we've got Jessica Cruz, who's going to be part of the Green Lantern series as well. But this is, she is the main character in this Wonder Girl series, Yara Flores. So, I think this is going to be really, really neat. I think that this is a different spin. I, li- I really, really like that they're taking the, the, the angle that we're taking. And yeah, if we get Brazilian mythology in this, and you can open the door to something a lot of people, including myself don't know nearly enough about, I think that is where a lot, a lot of intrigue can rely for this Wonder Girl series. So I think there's a lot of reasons to be excited about this one. How about a little bit of trailer talk? Speaking of new series, how about a new series from Amazon Prime Video called The Wild? And think of it as Lost, but with teenage girls. So yes, there you see that the trailer was up at downandnerdypodcast dot com. You've probably seen it. It is a young adult series. It's Amazon Studios' first young adult series, which I was like, really, is it? And I went back and checked, and yeah, it kind of is their first young adult series. And it is there. There are a lot of lost vibes. Okay, there are a lot of lost vibes in this, but there also are definitely some differences to this too, right? Because you know how. Manifest deals with this too, where you've got it, obviously plane crash involved there. Well, well, it, actually the plane didn't really crash, but anyway, Manifest deals with the the trauma that is with all the passengers and some of this, you know, teenage angst. I guess is another way to put it, and that's a lot of what you're you're getting in this trailer for the Wilds, and and there's a line in the trailer, and I'm paraphrasing this as. The worst part was being a teenage girl. So, you know, you're trapped on this island and you're a teenage girl and that just makes it worse. And there's nothing more teenager than watching somebody try and swim down to the bottom of the ocean to get a phone. Right? That's one of the things in the trailer. And I know I shouldn't have chuckled at it, but I did. It's because you see her phone sinking and you see like swimming to go get it. I'm like, that is so 2020. That is so... This generation, isn't it? Your phone. Obviously, I get it. You know, you're stranded on this island. If you had a phone 
and you could call for help, that would be helpful. But it's literally sinking in the ocean. I know they're making phones better nowadays. Probably not be- not probably not good enough to survive that. You, at some point, you just gotta let the phone go, right? But anyway, I mean, this does look. There's a lot to this. If you look, if you look at the trailer, there is more to this series than just the being stranded on the island thing. You know, much like lot, there was more to Lost as well. But I mean, there's also this sort of dystopia thing going on here. But there's also a an aftermath type of situation here going on as well. And the, the description of the series says that these girls did not end up on this island by accident. And we see something at the end of the trailer that makes you go, wait a minute. Uh, did they do this on purpose sort of thing? So obviously that's not a spoiler because it's in the description and it's in the freaking trailer. So, you know, you'll see for yourself when you see the trailer, but they won't see the series until December the 11th and there's a lot of new names and faces involved in this series Rachel Griffiths who you might recognize from six feet under is going to be one of the characters might be the only one that you actually recognize right away but as far as the showrunner here goes how about Marvel's daredevil writer Sarah Stryker and there, or, or I think that's I think it's Stryker anyway. It's Stryker or maybe maybe that's it. You know how bad I am with names. But I mean, you get a Daredevil writer to go on this series, and I, I know how much you love Daredevil. I did too, and the writing was one of the best things about that series. How that one of the reasons it was so well done, and it should be no surprise that this comes. It's going to be co-produced by Amazon Studios. And ABC Signature, which is a partner of Disney. So, you know, that's there's there's your Marvel Daredevil connection right there. So what's also going to be cool is, is that they're actually going to do a free at much like they did with the flight attendant on HBO Max through Christmas Day, starting on December the 11th through Christmas Day when the series premieres on Christ on December the 11th. The premiere episode of The Wilds is actually going to be free on Amazon's YouTube channel and, of course, social social media handles as well. So you'll get to watch the first episode for free. And if you get hooked, there you go. So here's something else that I was looking forward to. The Tom and Jerry movie that has that, yeah, haven't really heard much about. But, yes, Tom and Jerry are getting their own movie from Warner Brothers in March of 2021. I say March of 2021 because I'm not sticking a date on there and having it get moved. Again, so I'm I'm just not going to do that to myself. But I mean, you see this Tom and Jerry movie, and you got Chloe Grace Moretz that's going to be part of the cast. You got Michael Pena, Rob Delaney, Colin Jost, Ken Jeong. So you got a lot of fun names attached to this, and it's basically a you know you think Tom and Jerry are cool now, right? Maybe not so cool because Jerry's now stowed away in this hotel. They need him out because they've got the wedding and century going on here. They hired Tom to get Jerry out, and the madness ensues. So basically, it is going to be a cranked-up episode of Tom and Jerry that involves both live action and animation. And does something like this seem a little dated? I mean, you could make that argument, I guess, but to me, that is a very nitpicky stance to take. It's like, look, it's Tom and Jerry. Let's just have fun with it, huh? And I know I said that about the Lego Star Wars holiday special, and I kind of griped about that a little bit. But to me, it's if it's Tom and Jerry, you're not in this for brilliance. You're in it for what you loved Tom and Jerry for in the first place, and that was this rivalry and them kind of fighting it out. And you have to see, it's almost like to me because it's a it's it's a theatrical release. It's a it's a major motion picture, as they like to say in the biz. They're going to crank it up a notch. So there's going to be stuff that you might have seen in the cartoons when you were younger that you're not going to see in this series, excuse me, in this movie because it's going to be cranked up because that's what you do when you release a movie. You go all out, right? So I just think, and I love the animation style on Tom and Jerry. You you didn't go full-on CG like some of the other movies have done. Not that there's anything wrong with that. 
but I think you stand out and you you're different by doing things in more of a classic looking animation style. Now again, a cranked up version of that, of course, but I think that this was a very smart move on Warner Brothers' part. We'll see if it makes that March fifth, twenty twenty one date or not. I kind of hope that they do, but if not, hey, we'll just go ahead and update it. How about that? This next trailer, we didn't even think this was ever going to have a date. It's been so long delayed, but Chaos Walking has finally released its trailer from Lionsgate. And if you don't really know anything about this movie, it's basically, it, first of all, it is based on a novel, by the way. It's based on the novel The Knife of Never Letting Go from Patrick Ness. And it is basically Tom Holland and Daisy Ridley together. And Daisy Ridley's character crashes on this planet and all the women have kind of disappeared. The men are afflicted by this thing called the noise and that puts all their thoughts on display. So you can basically hear what all the men are thinking all the time. And it's this literal like vibration that comes out. You see that in the trailer. It's almost like this flash of light type of thing. Really, really interesting and really, really dangerous stuff. Imagine all of your thoughts just sort of being able to pop out and be available for everyone to hear and everyone to see. That's part of the intrigue of this. And also, first of all, you're like, like, you know, what happened to all of the women? So, of course, there's some unease about a woman being on this planet now. So one of the things that ends up having to happen is keeping Daisy Ridley's character safe. And that seems to be a huge premise for the movie. Plus, it seems like there's more unease about her presence in some than in others because there's still a secret on this planet they clearly don't want let out. And, and it centers around Tom Holland's character as well. And it's important for somebody on this island. It looks like Mads Mikkelsen's character is going to be a part of this resistance that doesn't want Tom Holland's character finding out what's really going on here. But, I mean, it seems interesting and intriguing enough. I mean, it seems like it, it was it's based on a young adult novel. But I don't know that it's really truly a what I would consider... A young adult story, but I mean, hey, I'm intrigued. It's just one trailer too, so I'm, I'm certainly interested in finding out more. And as far as like when this is coming out, it, the the trailer's just coming soon, so I won't venture the guess on any kind of date here. I think it originally had a January of 2021 date, so we'll have to keep an eye on that one as well. Speaking of something that is definitely coming out in January of 2021, and that is because it is a animated feature from Warner Brothers Home Entertainment. And I love what they're doing with the DC animated movies now because we're getting Batman Soul of the Dragon, which is another Elseworlds tale. And it's going to come out digital HD January the 12th. And then on Blu-ray and 4K, the combo packs will hit on January the 26th. It's got this really cool 70s vibe and you got Batman with Richard Dragon and Shiva and and Bronze Tiger well Ben Turner in this particular case and you kind of see in the trailer how like there you see them training together what looks like the monastery in this version anyway so they train together now they're back together to sort of team up and fight this cobra cult that is kind of wreaking havoc on the world right now and you get to see really this really cool interaction between Richard and Bruce Wayne, and it seems like they kind of go back and, and, and are closer than any of the other part of the group. It's it's just got this really cool vibe. And the, the, the soundtrack, the, just the soundtrack and the trailer seems so gnarly. And then you've also got just the animation style of Bruce Tim, who's going to be involved in this as well. So you get those, you get a little bit of Batman the Animated Series vibes nested in this cool 70s action flick that's just it's just gonna be amazing i don't even have to see this thing to know it's amazing i cannot wait to watch and review this thing though i'm really really psyched about this trailer for batman soul of the dragon so yeah keep an eye out or keep an ear out i should say for my review of this one because again you're mixing martial arts with a batman story like the deep martial arts here i am all about that that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Again, speaking of martial arts, thanks to Elaine Moussi for joining me this week to talk about jujitsu, which you can see right now. Go run. I mean, get see this thing any way you can. It's going to be a really fun, 
fun martial arts movie ride for you. If you want to find out more about what we've got going on, you can always go to downandnerdypodcast.com. Also find us on social media at downandnerdy757 on Twitter and Instagram and at downandnerdy on Facebook. But above all, remember, you never have to apologize for being a nerd. So let your fan flag fly and be good to your fellow nerds.